Okay, we are going to keep our international theme going this morning with, our, with a Chinese peer-to-peer -peer lending panel. So we have, <clears throat> as I said in my presentation yesterday morning, I mean, China is one of the most fascinating countries in the world when it comes to this industry. There is so much happening, there are so many different business models, there's so much innovation, and it is so much bigger than the, and than the industry anywhere else in the world. So we are, we're delighted to have several prominent members of the peer-to-peer -peer lending community in China here today. And they're gonna be led by the mo our moderator, Drew Mason, who is the founding managing partner of Jade Capital. Please welcome our China panel. Hey, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. We're waiting for one more panelist to join. But in the interest of starting on time, my name is Drew Mason. We'll be talking about China and the peer to peer lending market. I think what's fascinating, you know, the old expression, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And having been invested in China for about 25 years, I'm very excited to be here today. I still have a spring in my step when talking about peer to peer lending, particularly with this panel. We're very fortunate to have some of the real innovators in the field from Credit Ease, which was credited with really founding peer-to-peer -peer lending in China. Seoul have a unique perspective of being one of the co-founders of Lending Club and give you his perspective two and a half years on the ground now in China about how it's different or similar to the US. Hubert from Ping On, which is Lufax subsidiary, which is one of the great financial institutions in China. And in a moment, yeah, here he is, uh, Dr. Zane Wang, of CRF who helped build a lot of the consumer credit infrastructure that exists in China today. Well, to start, I think there are three things that we really would like to cover. First of all, that China is a big market, and that's probably the most obvious, but it's worth talking about. Second, this is more unusual. There's actually some innovation going on in the China market where we'd argue that actually you don't necessarily even see in the US. And the third, there's always a but. But China is different, so we're going to need to talk about the differences. With that, so why should you care? Why should you care about China? You've heard it's big. So to start, we'll try to set the table a little bit. And I'm going to ask Seoul to comment, who's had the benefit of being involved with Lending Club and now two and a half years on the ground in China, how he thinks about the size of the addressable opportunity in China. OK, thank you. Um, China is important. And the reason why China is important, it's, uh, it represents all emerging markets. Sorry. Bedtime. <laughs> so, <laughs> she left on the chair. <laughs> so, so uh, China represents um, a large market, but it's also the question that I get all the time. Yes, P2P is a very good business model, but it only works in the US and in the UK because you have an infrastructure. China is important because it's a large market, but if China works, India will work, uh, Indonesia will work, Africa will work. So it represents really uh, the power of what the internet can do in the financial industry. Yes, markets are very different. Uh, the type of loans are very different. Culture is very important. The way we create a product in China, the way we do underwriting in China, the way we do collection in China depends a lot on cultural thing. And of course, there is regulations. So going to China the first year and a half for me was education. I was learning how the market works. I was learning how all the players works. Before coming to China, I thought the concept of guaranteeing a loan is a crazy idea. But I understand now why that business is very popular. The education level in investing in China is not the same as in the US. You can easily convince a person in the US to lend money because you can create comparables to the stock market and he can understand that there is risk involved and he knows what diversification means. But in China, if you convince a lender to put money in a loan, the first question he's going to ask you, is this guaranteed? And some people will just be happy hearing the word, yes, it's guaranteed, 
and they don't ask the second question, how are, how are you guaranteeing it? So you have to create the product that match what the customer wants, what the society wants at that point. So it's a really, really very different. To be a little controversial, uh, so I'm investing in China 25 years, and one of the hard things about China is getting good numbers. And when people looked at non-bank lending, it was fascinating to see the different statistics that came out a year or two ago. Some thought it's $2.7 trillion, but there'd be a plus or minus of a trillion dollars depending on who did the calculation. So we can agree it's a, a big market, but fraught with some data difficulties. Hubert, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective. You know, Ping On is one of the largest insurance companies in the world. You guys don't get involved in small businesses. What attracted you in terms of market size growth to look at peer-to-peer -peer lending in China? Uh, I think Ping An, um, is, is, Ping An is the largest non-stale enterprise in terms of revenue uh, as of 2013. So Ping An look into the, uh, um, the PVB entry as a way to, to grab um, consumers online. As, as, as a traditional financial instit institution um, in China, Ping An would traditionally source the, the customers from physical stores. So they would need to build physical stores and span the physical stores to attract more customers. And four or five years ago, Ping An realized that you know, the internet thing is, you know, is, is getting, was getting bigger and bigger. So, so they need to somehow have a foray into the internet world and have the ability to sort of grab consumers online directly and have the ability to interact with consumers online directly. So, that, so, so Ping An saw this as a good opportunity, you know, being able to um, sort of source investors online. And, and this, this is the first time that investors Investors could come to our website, um, select invest, uh, in, uh, inv investment items, you know, and finish the transaction online, all online, without going to a physical store. So, um, in terms of addressable market, China has about four million. I'm sorry, four hundred million uh, internet users, and then, and th and that only stands for forty percent of of, of, of pop, uh, penetration. So, like U.S., you know. In, Penetration is at 70%. So that's looking at you know 70% of 1.3 billion people. That number is staggering. So uh, so you know you just uh, Ping An just saw it as a, as a good opportunity to jump into the foray and sort of grow with the internet financial in industry. So I'll come at it slightly a different way. Zane was probably credited with helping establish all the consumer credit infrastructure. At the time I met him, there were only three million credit cards in all of China. I remember when we helped co-found Sohu 25 years ago, one of the big media internet companies in China. How to estimate a market size was complicated. Zane, maybe you might comment about penetration. You've seen credit cards, half the credit cards in China at one point were underwritten to your systems. But only 10% of people actually have a credit file at the National Credit Bureau. How do you think about addressable market? Yeah, I would think the, uh, the addressable market in China is a tremendous. If you do some sort of comparison, in US market, the overall credit card penetration rate is more than probably 58, 60%. But in China, it's about 9 or 10% of the overall credit card penetration rate. But in terms of the overall the credit card balance as a count of the GDP, in China, it's about like 2%. But in US, it's, 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 it's a large number. So in terms of comparison, the overall credit card penetration rate in the US is much higher. More importantly, the reason for P2P business getting emerged in the US market is fundamental reason. The fundamental driving force behind that is people try to do credit consolidation. But in China, the major reason is for credit access. Because of that, uh, in China market, uh, people borrow from a P2P platform, not only so-called in US concept, so-called the, the theme file in credit bureau sense, but actually there are no files. Those people who do not have a credit access. That's a fundamental difference. And the, uh, we think uh, that the market potential for China, particularly for use for young generation, is, is a huge because of the, the, the banks, when uh, cannot, uh, not enough uh, driving for them to offer credit for a large population, particularly for those people ranked in the lower credit spectrum. So before we move off the China's a big market, kind of two quick points. Zane mentioned that it's about 
of GDP is non-bank lending, whereas in most economies at similar level, it's a multiple of that. So we can understand that it's a growing mark where they can penetrate. And the second thing we can point to, there's $2.7 trillion, plus or minus, call it half a trillion, of lending that's going on that's not done by the banks. So I think we can agree that China is a large potential market. I now want to talk about innovation, because I think a lot of people in this room are very interested in innovation and may not necessarily think about China. And I want to start with credit ease with Yihan, because we first have to give them credit for being the first to really pioneer peer-to-peer -peer lending in China. Although private lending between individuals in China has been going on for centuries. So they actually have a very long tradition with the exception of the Cultural Revolution. And until recently, private individuals lending around a dinner table to start a business was functionally illegal, even though that's where most of the capital formation came from to start the China miracle, because banks don't lend in China effectively to small and medium enterprises that are private individuals. But we have to give credit to credit ease for first pioneering that model. And, and in addition, you're now involved, something that we don't see as much in the US, that credit ease is also distributing multiple different types of financial products. Maybe you could talk about that innovation. Right, we started with uh, P2P. Actually, we started with uh, our CEO lending his own money to like training schools. That's how everything started. But uh, as we grow the business, we understand more about our customers, especially for like investors. We, the education in China, because investors in China are totally different. They are not, you know, they don't understand about risk. So, and they don't understand about, uh, uh, you know, the asset management and everything. So we, based on our understanding, actually, we are expanding into, for example, wealth management. We have a big wealth management team where we pr provide like um, customer services and a lot of other um, like crowdfunding for some real estate projects. In addition to P2P, also we sell like a mutual fund for uh, third party products. And also we, in terms of online, we focus on more higher end uh, customers where they are more internet savvy so that we more prime customers for borrowers and for lenders, uh, it's also more of um, internet savvy people. So we kind of give the whole menu of uh, multiple products there. And how big would you say your wealth management biz is now in terms of assets, just to give the audience a, a sense of it? It's, uh, I think it's still more than 50% is from the P2P asset. And uh, about 30% of our wealth management is from other projects, products. Well, thank you. That's one example of innovation. I'll give another one that I'm going to ask uh, Hubert to comment on. And then in the US, you don't see a lot of very large, sophisticated financial institutions like Ping on, you know, enter something like the peer-to-peer -peer sector and really try to compete on an internet basis. Maybe you could comment a little bit about what led Ping on to be that innovative. Mm, I I, th I think it's really the uh, it's really a competition. Uh, I think the, the uh, our chairman Ma, okay. I mean, he has he has an ambition to be the to be the biggest uh, financial institution in China in terms of customer count. Okay, so Ping An currently has about 80 million customers throughout ver various uh, products that we offer: insurance product, car insurance, or uh, banks. Um, but the, the largest financial institution in in China is uh, ICBC which is the uh, uh, biggest banks in, in the world. Uh, they have roughly um, 200 million customers. Okay, so, uh, so, so, so we, we always think about, so in terms of cu customers, how can we overtake ICBC, maybe in terms of five years, in terms of 10 years? Um, you know, uh, we definitely, uh, we can always open more stores. But ICBC's got 20,000 branches in China. Okay, uh, Ping An maybe has 1,500. So we definitely cannot overtake them you know, by opening up more branches there. So therefore, we absolutely need to go online. Okay? And, and so compared to the traditional um, uh, financial institution, the Ping An is more in innovative. So we think of different ways. When we really bring different technologies, you know, we look at different technologies. So how, what kind of technology we can, we can leverage? So, so that's really, that's an impetus for us to, to look at internet. Okay? So if we, 
And, and that is, I think that's one of our you know, biggest advantages compared to the traditional financial institution, that we are more agile, that, you know, um, and also, uh, since we're not state-owned enterprise, um, we have the freedom to make decisions that we, want, we need to make. And uh, so, so what we have done with P2P so far in the last two years, uh, it's unfathomable, you know, if it was coming from a state-owned enterprise. Anyway, so that's, that's where we are. And P2P is, uh, is just one of the business lines for Lufax. And Lufax was um, established about two and a half years ago. Our goal is to be the biggest uh, non-standard financial asset exchange in China. And so when we look at financial assets, you know, we, non-standard, we take anything that's not you know, tradable in, electronically, so anything that's debt-based, you know, P2P or uh, you know, financial asset debt structure. I mean, so that's, where, that's what we're looking at on the asset side. So P2P is, is one of them. But on the investor side, you know, we're looking at you know, uh, getting investors uh, online and offline individuals um, and also business and financial institutions. So therefore, and, and the, so the exchange sort of acts as an intermediary that we, we link the assets to the investors. And that's what we are. So the third example of innovation, which I'm going to ask Zane about, he was credited with creating the first FICO type system that would work with Chinese language within China for decisioning. So he made the first automated decisioning system for China. So he's no stranger to innovation. But one thing I'd like him to comment about is we've seen some unbelievable changes. So when I was chairing institutional investor forum with the top asset managers globally, their jaws dropped when I told them that Alibaba, through one of their subsidiaries, in a space of months, had originated 70 to $80 billion through a mobile app called Leftover Treasure. And in that short period of time, they overtook the largest asset management firm, China Asset Management, in all of China. Maybe, Zane, you could comment about, we obviously have some very innovative consumers out there that are using mobile and deploying their savings in a radically different way. Maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, uh, in China, uh, the, uh, the right now is really uh, talk about the so-called the uh, long tail kind of the uh, theory uh, phenomenon in China because uh, the the opportunities for people to manage their their money, manage their the so-called wealth management, actually the options out there are really very limited. Uh, ordinary people, they do not have a large range of their selections where they, they park their money. Uh, that's why uh, companies like uh, Alibaba do establish uh, a service for ordinary people to manage the very small amount of money, the, the small amount of the so-called daily living kind of the uh, size of the money, achieve the uh, great success, which has caused a major impact on banks uh, deposit the situation. That's why actually banks are not very happy about it, and the regulatory actually taking some sort of the uh, actions against that kind of the activities right now. But actually, this reflects a, a, a very clear fact in China uh, situation right now we are facing, which is ordinary people they try to find a way to manage their money, and the uh, right now peer-to-peer -peer lending platform provides an alternative for people, for ordinary people, to manage money. People get the uh, satisfactory returns compared with their uh, money deposit in the bank accounts. So this is the situation developing very fastly, even though the overall size of the P2P market in China is relatively small, but it prevents uh, good alternatives for ordinary people to manage their money. Uh, compared with other forms like uh, 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 trust of some sort of PE funds or some sort of the, uh, uh, the other alternatives. Peer-to-peer -peer provides the low entry barrier, uh, relatively easy to get into, and the, uh, that's why actually the government in some sense encourage the development of internet financing, particularly government takes a, a fairly positive way towards the peer-to-peer -to -peer lending, even though government tried to set up the so-called uh, some guiding principles for P2P companies how to operate their business in the, uh, uh, in the so-called, uh, based on those guiding principles, uh, the overall market right now is trying to provide people, both sides of people, for people on, on the demand side, providing some sort of the, uh, um, the access, who, access to credit, which is normally they cannot get from the banks. On the other hand, also provide people, ordinary people, 
to manage their uh, small balance or small amount of the leftover money such that uh, no other alternatives can provide us uh, the uh, similar returns. Oh, um, I'd like to add something. Um, I guess just uh, last night I was just looking at uh, you know, how, I mean, how big is the personal financial asset in China. And the number I, I, I saw was 65% of fin personal financial assets are still parked in safe bank saving deposit, 65%. So that amounts to 60 trillion RMB. So that's 10 billion RMB USD. That's just sitting in the bank deposit, you know, collecting like minimal interest. You know, so therefore, uh, you know, ordin ordinary citizens, they are always just trying to look uh, for opportunities, you know, how to get better return. You know, uh, right now, the, for, for example, the one year deposit, uh, you get 3.25%, which is pretty good for US, but in, in China, that's fairly low. Uh, you know, because you know, when you factor in the inflation, which is at five or six percent, you know, put your, putting your money in the bank, you're actually losing money every year. So I think we've talked a bit, we're going to turn to now how China is different. I think we've established 2.7 trillion is non-bank lending, peer-to-peer -peer is some part of that, and it's growing because of low penetration. I think we've talked that it's innovative, uh, but now we need to talk about how it's different. And I thought I was going to ask Sol to, again to help us set the table giving his perspective from Lending Club, regulatory. We're, not, we're only going to talk about a little bit. It's a complicated subject in China, but you have to really start with it. And uh, how did you think about it, Sol? There are a number of interesting markets in the world that you could have entered. You chose China, knowing that it has a complicated regulatory environment. What made you comfortable? Actually, believe it or not, the system of laws in China is, was, was attractive for us to go there. So we had the option to do Brazil, Germany, India, and China, and Russia. So in China, to individuals, if I lend you money and you don't pay, there is a legal system that I can follow. It's going to take three months, six months. Uh, I will have uh, a judge that's going to rule on my favor, but then I have to do other things to collect the money. I hear that in India, it could take five to 10 years. So, so multiple things helped us make the decision that China is a good market for us. One of them is the internet. The second one is the system of laws that I just mentioned. But the third one is obviously the size. But what I would like to, to talk about is, I'd like to ask people to be realistic. I mean, the comparison between the US and China does not really make sense. If you wanna compare the US to China, you should compare actually China to the US plus Mexico plus South America, all of them. Because Shanghai has nothing to do with Changsha. It's 1.4 billion people, and it's 100% asymmetric society. Mm -hmm. I mean, good luck with the FICO score, but which population is it going to cover? Is the data going to cover people living in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, or is it going to cover people that have never banked before? So this is really the difficulty that we have in China. There is no one single market. The reason. The reason that P2P is very successful and will continue to be successful is that there is a very uh, big shortage of investment products in China. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're right. People are keeping their money in banks and they are collecting absolutely nothing. The stock market in China is not as popular as the stock market in the US. So people cannot invest and feel comfortable that the volatility is not gonna go up the roof one day or another. So, we created, all these companies created an investment product that is really appealing. And it's appealing because it's low cost and because it gives you diversification. And each company has a certain ways to do underwriting and increase the return on that uh, product. For us, when we arrived first to China, we knew that P2P companies is almost like, okay, I will guarantee you this return and don't ask me where do I put the money to. And we thought, no, we can still do the pure P2P model where people choose who gonna borrow their money. But we focused more on technology and we created a new loan product. So for example, we specialize a lot in small and medium-sized enterprises. A lot of people in Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou have cash businesses. So every day there is a lot of money in their register, but they don't know what to do with it. So we help them. We look, we look at uh, China uh, finance as a logistics problem. And our goal is to move money between borrowers and lenders as often as possible and as quick as possible. And that's what creates value for us. 
probably what we'll do in the time that we have left, and we're going to open up for questions in about 10 minutes. But I'd say you'd actually, the differences are so significant, you really have to walk through each portion of the value chain, whether it's origination, how you do a fraud, analytics, funding, collection, segmentation. But for right now, why don't I touch on two? And maybe, yeah, maybe you could comment. Peer-to-peer -peer is often thought in the States as originally as online, but in China, just like C-Trip, for some of you who are familiar with it, they actually started really very much as a traditional offline travel agency, but was very successful over time migrating online. It's no different really in peer-to-peer -peer lending originally. So maybe you could talk a little bit, Jan, about Credities originally was all offline and over time is now migrating online. And why was that? Well, um, Credities started eight years ago. At that time, you know, it was not as many internet people are there. Even now, still a lot of business, especially young, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they don't have time to go on the internet. But the most important thing is that there is no like infrastructure, the data infrastructure, the credit system is not there. So offline is so important because you really have to go face to face to evaluate your customers and to provide service to your customers. In addition, in addition to like sales, because the sales people, they know where to find the right customers. Financial services is really to find good borrowers. That's the key. They're really good at finding customers. But even now, with the internet and big data booming, I, in addition to sales and also to services, I see them actually very good in the future. Even with my online business, uh, our offline people, they are very good reach to collect data. You know, later we have more data, big data. Even the customers that we don't approve now, we don't serve now, in terms of that geographic location, uh, that family, that business, we have a lot of data that they can help to collect. So I see a huge, you know, complement. So this is a great point that Nihon's making. I think people in the audience try to appreciate, and Zane alluded to this. If you went to the National Credit Bureau, only 10% of people in all of China actually have a record there. Mm -hmm. So 90% of this market doesn't have a credit file. And Sol's point about the key aspect of regionalization, you know, how you evaluate potential borrowers in each region is so different. And we'll talk a minute about fraud because it's important to talk about it because about half of credit loss for credit card companies comes from fraud loss. So we'll get back to that in a minute. But maybe, Zane, you could talk to us. You help advise on the National Credit Bureau. What's the use of the Credit Bureau, or how does one deal with this issue that you go there and there's no hit, there's no data? How do you deal with this problem in China? Yeah, it's actually it's a quite uh, different uh, problem compared with the, uh, the peers in the U.S. market, because in the U.S. market, you have a treasure of a Credit Bureau. Credit Bureau can be provided as a source of the marketing customer acquisition. But in China, uh, there are two issues we have to deal with. The first of all, the overall coverage is low because uh, a lot of people do, do not have a credit, such that they, they don't have a credit history, such that they are not covered by credit bureau. Secondly, even though for those small portion they're covered by credit bureau, uh, companies like a P2P company, even banks cannot use a credit bureau as a marketing uh, customer solicitation source. They can only use a credit bureau as a credit evaluation. So based on that, so really the customer acquisition, if you through the traditional so-called U.S. Uh, the uh, mindset, using stuff with the credit bureaus through through the stuff some sort of the pre-approved kind of campaign, you actually cannot do that in China. That's why you create a quite a different dynamic in China market. You really have to acquire for P2P companies also. Uh, usually, t typical P2P companies in China, you cannot get a direct access to the, direct the online access to credit data files. So you really have to find a way to paint a picture of a customer's uh, so-called risk profile. You can do this kind of thing by a couple of ways. One would be through internet uh, uh, platform uh, to try to find all the data relevant to this particular borrower to paint a complete picture through the online world. The other way to do it is go through the traditional offline uh, method, which is you really visit the borrower, uh, try to identify borrowers, uh, like so where they live, where they work, what kind of things they do, what kind of the financial in and out kind of situation is, trying to get a clear sense what is this customer's credit worthiness. So you really have to do things differently 
compare with the traditional, I mean, the typical way of the U.S. market. I would think that this presents a unique, actually, uh, value proposition for uh, China's uh, P2P market because really uh, Chinese P2P companies can either develop their business using so-called big data through the internet platform or they can develop the offline approach or using some sort of online to offline approach to get a clear sense actually this data actually is not available in the credit bureau or either uh, banks. So this is kind of the situation we're working to. I will find the situation is a very interesting. And the CIF actually as a company, we're using uh, analytical power to attack the issue. We're screw, uh, going through the slight different angle. But we think this is a very interesting market, very interesting issues for all the P2P companies to face. So before we talk, and we're going to open up for questions in a minute about the future, uh, I think there's probably one more thing I'd like to have the panel talk about in terms of how China is different. So when I set up the Technology Investment Banking Group for Asia Pacific for UBS in 2000, these companies didn't really exist. But there are probably two companies, one of which you've heard of, Alibaba and Alipay. But there's another one called Tencent, probably the one company that $100 billion market cap a lot of people in the room may not have heard of. But these are the two mega forces now today in China. Lots of data, massive number of customers. Some people have a concern. I'd like to hear what our panelists would like to comment. You know, is this going to be a game changer now that both these companies are now targeting financial services, targeting small loan lending, or is there enough of a market there for everyone to find their role? Shall I start? Sure. So uh, uh, now I can come back to the US. <laughs> same way we have Google, we have Facebook, we have eBay. You could have asked the same question when Lending Club was small. But I think. Uh, this model does not belong to the internet, does not belong to the banking world. It's a new model, and it's open for everyone to use. What I see in China right now is that there is a big discussion that involves regulations, involves a lot of things. Who is going to get this market? Are we going to replace banks with internet companies, or are we going to empower banks with technology like ours, like other companies that are working on them, so they can offer a product similar to what these internet companies are offering. My personal opinion, and it's my opinion alone, is that this is going to go more towards banks. Mm -hmm. In fact, the fact that uh, we hear from China that the CBRC is the entity that's going to regulate this business makes it look like, OK, we are going in that direction. Yesterday, I don't know, mentioned that Lending Club has started a big cooperation with Union bank. So everybody is going into that direction. What happened in the last five years is that all together collectively we showed to the banking world that there is another way of doing business. Mm -hmm. And now it's time for banks to transform themselves. And yes, we do see that in China. Originally we were like approached by uh, small financial companies, uh, companies that uh, uh, want to create new models to do risk management, but banks have been doing this in China and the US for the last 100 years. And they have some kind of solutions to how do I underwrite a person. So the proposition that we brought is like, oh, you know what? It would be good if you can underwrite a person and give him a loan within two minutes. And that's the infrastructure that is lacking in China because you don't have data like Ihan said. And, but still, the internet can help. Technology can help in a lot. For example, the lender side, 100%, is done online sourcing lenders, giving them the services and all of that. So I think what happened so far is that we are not an experiment anymore. We are a serious business and banks are interested in leveraging what we do. And I think that's a good future for, for our industry. Yeah. Uh, in terms of competition, um, there's a, a very popular phrase in China right now. It's called internet finance. Okay. So, so, but when you think about inter internet finance, it's somewhat oxymoron because you have the banking side on, on one end. You know, people are very conservative; they are risk averse. You know, they want to do things really slow. I mean, the worst, the, the worst nightmare is you know, client lose, you know, lose money. But on the other end, you have the internet people. The internet people they think fast and they're young, and you know, they just you know, they want to do, they just want to try things out. So, so um, in in Lufax, I think two years when we first started the company, I mean, the biggest challenge that we had was sort of converge you know, the people from the two different cultures working together. 
Right? I mean, it's literally, I mean, because I came from the internet world, you know, I had to work with a, with a bank, with, with the traditional people. I'm like, come on, guys, you know, we, I need a decision now. <laughs> and people on the other end, they're like, oh, we need to look at a, you know, go through a compliance, we need to look at a regulatory, we'll get back to you in a month. I'm like, come on, you know, you know we, we, it's, so, so that um, conflict is going to happen everywhere you, you go. So, it, so, so now you're looking at the, the, the banking people that try to get to the internet, right? I mean, they are just way too slow, okay? They, they only think about compliance risk. Innovation is not in their blood, okay? Uh, on the internet people, they're like, let's get things going, right? I mean, in the P2P things, you really need to let the vintage flow. You need to see the vintage flow. You need to wait for six months. You need to wait for a year, right? You continue to adjust the model. So, I mean, you do need to have patience there, okay? So, I think so. This is one thing that we have done fairly successfully. That we uh, in Lufax, we sort of combine both worlds to, to, together. So, so I think um, so. This is the culture issue. Is you know you cannot be overlooked, and uh, and then, so I think that's definitely one of our biggest uh, biggest advantage. So compared to uh, to to a traditional financial institution, we're able to innovate. Okay, compared to the uh, sort of pure internet play, I mean we are uh, we. I mean the risk model for for. It's like, to, to the end of the day, it's really the risk model, you know, how you evaluate the, the customers. And, you know, and, you know so that we got to be able to sleep at night. And uh, so that I think, I think um, that's one of the advantages that Lufax has. And also, uh, with the banking of Ping An, uh, we work closely with, uh, with the regulators, you know, who are trying to set the standards. Um, P2P, we want to make P2P a, uh, you know, uh, cool things or uh, a new, sort of business uh, in China. Yeah, I just want to, want to make a very quick comment. Uh, data is important. Those are big companies, big, uh, the social network companies, they have a data. Data is important, but it's not enough. To be able to run a good so-called peer-to-peer platform, you really, other than data, you also need a good risk management. You need uh, like uh, systems, algorithms, methodology, and the way of thinking of the risk management. The third, you also need uh, some sort of the operation in place, such as uh, how to run, because the running a social network and uh, running uh, the so-called lending platform is uh, quite different. So the, those kind of components are important. So ne not necessarily a big data company can run a big peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So if a peer-to-peer -peer companies work with the data companies, uh, such as uh, put those, all those uh, elements together, I would think that would be create a, 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 a great uh, success for peer-to-peer. -peer. So maybe I'd say a uh, comment about the future and then we can look for questions. A lot of the entrepreneurs that have started businesses in China, this is going to be their first credit cycle. You know, go back to the Asia financial crisis or even the bank restructuring, you have to go back almost half a decade. So a lot of these new entrants that have entered peer-to-peer -peer lending, have, first of all, have no experience with a real downturn in China. They have no real experience with a credit cycle. And right now, with 1,000 peer-to-peer companies sprouting up, we do see some softening in the underwriting and market environment. How do you guys see that affecting the future? Combine that with some of these big internet companies that are well capitalized, plowing in there without really worrying about risk vintages and all these things that we know are important. How is that going to affect the future? I think. Um Really, P2P or internet finance is a very long-term thing. The key is really, you know, as other speakers talked about, is really the risk model and how to market to the right customers. You have to find the right customers efficiently. Those are the keys, and it's really a long-term thing. You know, it's like a marathon. You know, you have to do a lot of practice, training, to be successful in the race. You know, you have to deal with all the terrains, weather, and all different injuries. It's not, there are a lot of opportunities. There are more than 600 platforms in China, but really I think it will take a long time with the experience to understand your customers, to build your risk models. That's the key. You know, we're not in a hurry. We try to do the things. We understand, you know, we're sure what's the right thing to do, and we try new things. It really takes time. I think there will be several winners in the end, but. Uh, I don't see this as a, you know. Is there a risk that a bad apple and everyone gets tarred with the same brush? So Baidu recently closed down a whole bunch of peer-to-peer -peer websites because, right. as we've observed, half of credit loss is fraud loss. Verifying the identity of the borrower is actually complicated in China. Do you see the regulators at some point overreacting to this? Or is that something that we don't have to worry about? Uh, okay. I'm, I'm actually, go ahead. 
I'm actually all for regulations. Now, regulation is very good. Uh, any industry, you're not going to let uh, uh, people practice uh, doctors and open hospitals without regulations. You're going to have a big problem. Uh, also, the regulations apply to uh, the small companies as well as the big companies. Mm -hmm. So, but at the same time, uh, we want to encourage innovation as well. And China needs a lot of innovation. China needs a lot of infrastructure, and there is a huge opportunity. So, if you take a small company, if you take small companies and you shut them down, maybe that will be a big mistake. That could be the one that's going to solve your financial crisis in the in ten years after that. So. So we have, we have to be careful, and that's why uh, the regulatory job is not a simple one. It's a very complex one. So yes, you have power, but you have to be uh, careful when you use it, not to go against your economy. Hubert? Yeah, uh, I, I think any time that you're trying to innovate, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, definitely a risk involved. Uh, actually, uh, uh, when I was looking at innovation, I, I kept thinking, like, you know, Google, Google they have this sort of self-driven cars. So it's like, I mean, just think about what, what kind of consequences it's going to have. You know, when the self-driven car crashes, who's at fault, right? So now, this is, okay. So anyway, so that's the thing that regulation, regulations that I have to think about. So in, um, so back to China. So um, yeah. So I, I think um, we are seeing good trend in the P P2P industries. Um, recently, um, I think in the last three, three months or so, um, so seven to ten P2P companies we recognize as the, as the leading companies. And so we are forming a, uh, so, uh, committees and, you know, to bring the, all of us together. We're trying to set a standard. And, you know, we, and then tell, we, we, we want to demonstrate to the, to the regulators to say, okay, this is how P2P can be done. And, and, and then in terms of risk, I, I think that the biggest advantage of P2P is person to person, right? So if something happens, if a person defaults alone, only the other person is affected, right? You don't have this sort of systematic uh, crashes there, you know, like financial, if a financial institution mills down, right? And everybody's affected. So, um, and, then, and then we also think liquidity in secondary trading is, is really important. Like when you need the money, when something happens, right, you are able to liquidate what you have, even at a loss. Some loss is better than nothing at all, better than nothing at all. So I'll throw out one point, and then we're going to look for questions that, on regulatory, and like anyone on the panel to comment. There's one school of thought which says that since banks don't lend to SMEs or individuals, and that's where the majority of job growth comes from, mm -hmm. and it's where the majority of GDP growth, therefore, comes from, that the government has no choice but to continue to support non-bank lending because they've been trying to get the banks to do the right thing and have not been successful. Do you subscribe to that point of view that long term, really, the government has no support, no choice but to support the development of uh, non-bank lending? I would think the government is a strong um, right now, particularly this government. The current the, uh, government structure, the central policy is really try to encourage the private sectors get into financial service uh, business. They tried very hard to encourage the private sector to get into. As a matter of fact, they are actually the first the, uh, government for many years to really encourage establish the private banks, in private companies to get into the banking sector. Also, they take the very positive position towards the internet financing, and they actually give it a pretty high tolerance level towards the P2P companies. Even though P2P currently is a non-regulated business, they actually just set some high-level guiding principles to uh, let the uh, P2P operators how to operate within the parameters. But I would think the current central policy is a very positive. The reason is just, uh, as Drew just mentioned, uh, the government sees that actually the major driving force for this economy is a problem, uh, from the private sector, and the government tried to fuel the economy growth, and the appear to be lending as a, one of the factors can contribute that effect. We have a wonderful panel here today, and I think it'd be a great opportunity. Uh, can we take one question, or? Well, what, what, we actually are out of time. We're out of time. Can you put this mic on? Thank you. If you want to ask a question to the, to the China panel, they will, everyone here will be downstairs in Yosemite A at 11 o'clock, and they will be able to take your questions there. But we are now out of time. Um, thank you very much for our China panel. That was fascinating. And um, yes, thank you. Thank you.
It's now, it's now time for our morning break. Um, this morning break is sponsored by Borrowers First. Thank you.